Today we'll have a, um, a session that will be a little bit less than uh, an hour and 20 minutes, as Mansuk has explained. So uh, without further ado, let me um, get um, my slides up, my slides going here. And as usual, what I would like to do is um, to first do a quick reprise of about three or four slides from last time, which are quite important. Um, let's see, I didn't share that with you, hold on. Hmm, oh darn, here we go. Okay, can you see uh, the full screen of the slides? Yes. Yes, good, okay, great. So let me from last time just repeat about three or four key ideas on three or four slides. We talked uh, about um, chain reactions and criticality. Um, the, um, we talked about the neutron multiplication factor uh, with uh, k equals to one, um, me meaning that at each generation one has the same average number of neutrons as the previous generation. Um, reactors uh, operate in this mode, in this uh, mode, um, k less than one, you have exponential dying away of the number of neutrons and the uh, chain reaction stops. K greater than one is super critical. And if K is much greater than one, um, prompt critical, you have a, uh, a bomb. Um, let me only talk to the issue of a finite size fuel assembly. Uh, we talked about something you and nuclear engineering are familiar with, uh, the uh, six factor formula. Um, and just a simple, I have to not do this with the, um, the mouse. Okay, um, a simple example with uh, very representative numbers for a power reactor. Um, if you think about one complete generation, if I start with a thousand neutrons, um, the only factor um, uh, which helps you uh, uh, in uh, the cycle is uh, that a small fraction of the fast neutrons will induce fission. The cross sections are much smaller than the order of a barn or uh, a few barns uh, at the MEV range. Um, and therefore, on the average, one will get about 30 additional neutrons on top of the thousand. Because it's a finite assembly, some of the neutrons will leak. Um, the probability, uh, uh, one wants to keep that number high, of course, uh, representative number might be 95%. Um, uh, then, of course, you go through the resonance region as the neutron uh, moderates and slows down and on power reactors. We, these are normally uh, 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 reactors where the, the neutrons are thermalized. Uh, they um, have to pass through the resonance region where you have a thicket of very high energy resonances with very high cross sections, um, which can gobble up the neutrons and take them out of play. Um, representative number there would be 75%. Once the neutrons are thermalized, you can still have leakage. Um, uh, that, that induces another loss. So one assigns a, a value something like 96% or so there for, uh, as a representative value. Thermal utilization, does it capture on the, uh, uh, does it capture in the fuel? And then the reproduction factor, uh, which is how many neutrons one gets if it captures on the fuel. This is less than the um, average number of neutrons per fission because not every neutron that capture, captures even on uh, the, a, uh, a, a, the fuel, for example, uranium-235, will give rise to fission. And as we noted before, about one part in seven, here's 99 barns, uh, N gamma versus N fission being 585, um, will simply 
uh, be captured gamma decay to the to the ground state ultimately and be taken out of play and is not useful to the uh, to the pro problem. Okay, uh, uranium two thirty eight um, does not fission below uh, fast neutrons below about an MeV. It's negligible, uh, but it can still gobble up neutrons and take them out of play. Okay, um, what determines criticality? We went through some, some um, simple uh, uh, graphics there. Obviously the composition of the fuel, total mass, i.e. size, density. We argued that in fact, if the density um, uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, increased, then of course uh, the criticality is going to go up uh, dramatically. Uh, uh, the geometry, obviously one wants compact, ideally spherical or otherwise a compact uh, arrangement rather than taking the, the fuel and stretching it out into some uh, rod shaped or disc shaped uh, like that, which is you might call all skin. So the neutrons have a very high probability of leaving without significant probability of interaction. And then of course you can reflect like on a pool table, you can, you can bring neutrons back into play by using a tamper that might be beryllium or might be a tungsten carbide or something like that. There is, uh, become familiar with this. Um, here on this particular graphic, which I hadn't shown you before, this little blue, shaded blue band um, idealizes or represents the range of energies that are emitted from a fissioning nucleus with an average um, actually of about uh, mean energy of about two MeV. Um, here you see uh, below about 2 MeV, uranium-238 uh, is, is uh, negligible. Um, it's a, uh, a little more than a, a barn cross-section plutonium-239 and 235. And then when they, uh, the, if the neutrons are well thermalized, here's a thermal uh, here, which is about uh, 10 to the minus 8 MeV or, or uh, 1 40th of an electron volt, uh, that cross section is up at a thousand barns. Okay, let me now move on to um, my second. We'll do two other slide decks here. This second will be short. I wanted to show something. It's actually a. Um, I've taken most of the slides from here and put them into the following lecture, but I wanted to show one thing um, uh, to reinforce uh, sort of very viscerally the idea of geometry and um, the, uh, the geometry and criticality. Um, I don't know how many of you are uh, movie buffs, but uh, there was a movie, yeah, boy, um, in the 1980s uh, Paul Newman, and I forget who else was in it, called uh, uh, Little Boy and Fat Man, which was, uh, in fact, a movie based on the history of the Manhattan Project. And in there, there was a few minute um, uh, segment on a criticality accident uh, that happened after the war uh, with a Canadian physicist by the name of Louis Sloten, who was a 30 five years old at the time. He was a brilliant uh, guy. Um, if you saw the day after Trinity, when they were assembling the fuel on the, um, the large tower um, and see all these guys standing around in their t-shirts, it was rather obviously hot out there. And one person leaning in, taking the top half of the hemisphere and putting it down in the assembly. Um, actually, there were two people in that photograph, both of who died in, in subsequent uh, post-war criticality accident, accidents, uh, either during research or doing sort of pedagogical training at Los Alamos afterwards. So let me show you this. Um, ah, by the way, just beginning on before we get on to Louis. So um, this was uh, the world's first man-made reactor. We talked about this before. Uh, this was uh, Fermi's pile in Chicago under the football stadium. Um, it was um, made of natural uranium. Um, and because natural uranium is only 0.7%, uh, 235, one had to work very hard to get a critical reaction. And therefore, um, the um, core of this reactor 
to keep the neutron to moderate the, the neutrons and keep them in play had to be extremely pure graphite. You did not want any metals in there, particularly uh, vanadium, which is very often a, a typical contaminant if one uses something like uh, oil uh, uh, to uh, carbonize as oil or something to get uh, graphite. Uh, there's a, something called the Atchison process, which allows you to purify the graphite such that um, you have a uh, carbon has a very, very small capture cross section for neutrons. Um, and they used 45 tons of uranium oxide, natural uranium oxide. It was a zero power reactor. Actually, it's listed here as five watts, but it was basically to show that you could get <clears throat> a self-sustaining chain reaction. <clears throat> and it was a momentous time in uh, history. And of course, uh, they all went to lunch um, just before they fully removed the, bo the uh, uh, boron rods, um, the uh, control rods um, there, and then had a bottle of Chianti. And then everyone afterwards signed the wicker basket on the Chianti. Um, as I mentioned, I think some years later, I was teaching uh, 201, the graduate nuclear physics, and my students as a gift actually gave me a bottle, which is still in my office, uh, that everybody signed. This thing here, uh, about this little larger than a deck of cards um, is a um, glass uh, encapsulating a piece of the graphite from that reactor uh, there. Now, you might think that's as rare as a moon rock, but thousands of people have these things. Okay, let's talk about uh, the criticality accident that happened in May of 1946, which is going to exemplify um, the issue of um, um, uh, of geometry and what he was doing, um, you know, they were after the war was over, a scientist went back to the universities and so forth, but they were recruiting new people to come in to keep up the effort to design new weapons to, uh, you know, create, uh, keep the in industrial complex around the country going to create new pits to create new weapons to counter what was then go going to be ultimately a Soviet threat. Uh, Sloten was, uh, part of his job was to train new people in the art of handling, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 critical amounts of, of plutonium. And they were dealing with something called the demon core. And uh, here is a layout of the room uh, around a table, which we'll, we'll actually look at the little film and then we'll talk about this afterwards. Um, so anyway, let me click on this. He's using the blade of a screwdriver. Got it? To separate the two halves of this plutonium core. Behind the wall. Make it. Except me. I'm dead. 
And that's exactly what happened. In fact, he acted, well, Fermi had predicted that he and this, um, I'm forgetting his name now, the, uh, who had died about a year earlier in an accident because of their sort of cavalier sort of cowboy approach to, you know, to doing these experiments, you know, taking these two halves and separating them with the blade of a screwdriver, making them open and close like a clamshell. They said, you're, you're gonna be dead within a year. You, you guys are fools. And in fact, that's what indeed happened. Uh, but once the accident happened, he acted, uh, he did everything exactly right. He knocked the thing apart such that the, the, the reaction stopped. He told everyone, gave them a piece of chalk, told them to mark their position, um, measured the distance and made actually a, right on the spot, very accurate estimates of the amount of radiation they received. In his case, it was twice lethal dose 50. It was a thousand rads, what we call 10 grays today. Uh, in normal units, about 500 rads um, uh, is, you know, 50% uh, probability of uh, get, being a lethal dose. He died nine days later of a very horrific uh, death, hemorrhaging and infection, internal infection and so forth. Very, very, very. Um, New York Times Sunday Magazine did a follow-up study, I think, in that, or um, article in 1980 who were 88 on Alan Klein, who ended up um, living in the San Francisco area, who tried to get his medical records from the government. And sadly, uh, the AEC at the time, I sort of sort of stonewalled and it was not a, I think one of the government's finest uh, uh, moments. And the, the, the author of that story actually helped for several years try to chase down people to recover these records. Obviously the government was very, uh, the lab was very uh, sensitive to the issue of potential litigation uh, about this. Um, let's see, I'm going to delay several of these slides to later on. Um, um, so let me close this and hello. And now, move on to the next slide deck. Okay, so um, I'm going now to uh, the next two lectures. We're going to apply the things that you've learned, the basics of um, uh, the phenomenology of fission, cross sections, um, knowing how to calculate uh, Q values, velocities, uh, and uh, so forth, and some you know, very basic uh, differential equations. To, so you can actually work through um, an exercise on calculating the energy release and the time um, for a, um, a critical assembly of fissionable material. Um, and we're going to, um, I'm going to put on the web uh, what was unclassified in 1962 uh, by Robert Cer uh, Serber, who in 1943, again, was training the new recruits at Los Alamos. Um, he uh, had a, about a 20 or 30 page uh, typed uh, and handwritten and hand drawn set of notes on what was known at the time about cross sections. Um, um, the notion of uh, critical assembly, neutron multiplication, um, the, uh, the whole issue of uh, why uh, the uranium device and the plutonium device needed to be uh, different in design. We'll get into that. Um, and it is unclassified. It was actually a, a, a more cleaned up, uh, presentable version, sort of published about 30 years ago. Um, and um, you don't need to read through it, we're actually, but we are going to go through oh, completely through it. We are going to go through some aspects of Cerber's, um, it's called the Los Alamos primer. Um, so, um, pretty much everything you're going to see is from there and from other sources that uh, Lee Bernstein, who uh, has taught this course uh, as well as I have, um, have um, made sure are scrubbed by our friends uh, back uh, at. Uh, uh, at uh, inside the fence at Livermore, so don't get nervous. Okay, some notions of critical mass. And by the way, this was a little more of a uh, accurate representation of this experiment that happened. Uh, what was being adjusted with a screwdriver was not the core itself, it was actually the neutron reflector around it. Uh, but that there, there was kind of a little bit of a 
representation or reenactment of what went wrong in that uh, experiment. Okay, um, Charles Forsberg, then at Oak Ridge, now at MIT, um, was asked to do a, a, a an open study of um, uh, of uh, in that case, specifically for uranium-233, but he produced a number of you know, graphs and tables and so forth um, about critical mass um, of uranium. Um, and for reference, these all, all the calculations he did were for spherical assemblies, some bare, some, some with a, a, a tamper or a, a reflector around the beryllium reflector. And um, uh, here's one graph there, and as we mentioned, the first thing is composition. I forgot to put that down last time, but it's kind of obvious. Um, the, um, there's no critical mass for peanut butter. You have to be dealing with something which is fissionable or you're not going to uh, be able to make a bomb. If you have, in the case of uh, uranium, you are, we'll talk about separation technologies um, at a subsequent lecture, we'll talk about centrifuges, we'll talk about gaseous diffusion and so forth. Um, these are things which use physical property, uh, physical phenomenon, either diffusion or um, in the case of a centrifuge, um, just sort of you know, gravimetric or quasi gravimetric separation uh, to uh, exploit the very subtle difference in mass, 235 versus 238, to get a very slight enrichment per stage and by dint of many stages, hundreds or thousands of stages, um, one can get upwards of what uh, one wants for a uh, weapons material, which would be 90%, 92% or so. But one is always gonna be dealing with um, a, a non-fissile product or non-fissile contaminant in the, uh, in the assembly which of course uh, works against uh, having a prompt critical reaction, um, simply because as we mentioned, 238 eats up neutrons, but you don't get, there's no fission there. So it simply takes neutrons out of play and it works against you. So here's 235 uh, in 238. You see that um, uh, in fact, if you get below 5.4%, you will, you can never get it, it, you, it, you, would, uh, you know, there it, it takes an infinite mass to get a, a critical assembly. However, if you purify, there's a, you know, there's um, a 20%, uh, 235, 40%, 60%, 80%, 90%, you can get down to something like 50 or so kilograms being the critical mass at normal density. Okay. Um, here's a table. Um, uh, as part of an exercise um, that, um, well, Jake, uh, I, I, I've entrusted Jake and Aaron to uh, this year to, to uh, with full authority to generate the problem sets. But last year, we did a problem set where we actually took a, um, a um, uh, little boy fuel assembly and you work through all the numbers a la server. Um, and um, uh, you would be able to generate uh, do this uh, calculation. Um, but you see for 100% uranium 235, um, the mass is about 50 kilograms, uh, 48 kilograms. Uh, the generation time, which is simply the, um, uh, the mean free path divided by the average velocity is on the order of about five nanoseconds, um, you know, where you, you would, neutron would smack in and give rise to another fission. Um, as the uranium fuel becomes more and more impure, then of course um, the, um, uh, the the mass goes up until it's really quite unfeasible to make a uh, you know it, it becomes more and more difficult once you get into extremely large um, masses here. It's just not very feasible to make a, uh, a portable or weaponizable bomb. Uh, professor, yeah. Doesn't this calculation just give me a K greater than one? And don't I need to create much, a K much, much greater than one to blow things up? Uh, yes, uh, but this is also a bare sphere. Let's go on. Okay, now we have um, the reflector. Um, so, um, uh, and this in the case of um, Forsberg, this is beryllium. And it actually shows the increasing percentage of uh, uranium. And then it gives the three cases, reactor grade, plutonium fuel grade, plutonium weapons grade, 
grade plutonium. And you see um, in, in the case, we'll do the case of um, little boy later on in your problem set, um, um, as it was discussed in Cerber, the tungsten carbide is a tamper. This is, I, I believe, from Forsberg. This was a beryllium uh, uh, reflector. Um, you see at 93%, um, uh, the bare uh, uh, sphere is again 50 kilograms, but um, if you have a, uh, a significant uh, reflector around it, that number drops precipitously because you put the, the things back into play. So if you have a reflector and then have that original mass, then you're in business. As, but as you say, you want this to be K much greater than one. Just to reprise something we said before, what does 235 have going for it as a fuel, and you see all the way from fast, here's an MeV, here's 10 MeV, all the way down, um, fission dominates over neutron capture, which uh, and, and the N gamma reaction, which simply takes the neutron out of play. Conversely, 235, it's the other way around, um, except at very fast energies, at very uh, fast neutrons, high energies, uh, 10, uh, one to 10 MeV and above, um, the fission is way, way, way down, and the um, uh, capture, i.e. just eating up a neutron and doing nothing for you, is, is dominant. Carl, I think we have some, some, some good questions in the chat. Daniel, do you want to ask your question? Uh, sure. I was wondering what the distinction is between the reactor and fuel grade plutoniums uh, a couple slides back. Uh, let's see. I'd have to go back to Forsberg. Um, the... Um, Let's see, weapons grade and fuel grade. Weapons, oh, reactor grade. Uh, let me go back and check. Oh, sorry, that's with the tamper here. Um, okay, weapons grade, I believe is typically defined to be 93%, uh, certainly above 90%. Um, fuel grade is, um, let me go back and check with Forsberg there. Here it has reactor grade, fuel grade, and weapons grade, and the, and the critical bare mass is not all that different. Okay, let me get back to you on that. Well, did you say there were more questions? No, no, I, I, think, I think that's it. Great. So this is what's called, um, uh, I've mentioned this number 2MeV before, um, the, uh, this is what's known as the watt spectrum um, for the various um, uh, uh, sort of thermal fissioning uh, species. These are all typically very similar. Um, you do see that the uh, spectrum becomes a little bit harder um, if you have uh, fast neutron fissioning 235 in the case of, for example, a boosted weapon, 14 MeV neutrons. The spectrum does become harder, uh, particularly very noticeably at, at higher energies here. But the mean energy is uh, 2 MeV, and that's a number we're going to use and you use it when you work through a basic problem in your problem set as well. Um, okay, it peaks at around MeV, but the mean energy is around 2. Okay, let's get into server here. Uh, this is the um, first couple of pages, as you can see, when it was unclassified, things were scratched out and stamped and signed and dated and so forth. Um, uh, there's a easier to read, cleaner copy that I will also post up on the uh, web as well that I think came out in 1992 or so. Uh, what's interesting when you read server, it, it's, uh, did not touch the, not touch the uh, uh, the mouse here. Um, um, it's a little bit. It's not as easy to read as uh, even though the, the the I think the presentation of the material and so forth. It, it, it is not in the most user friendly way, and it takes a little time to figure out. They talk about um, um, they talk about the material forty nine and. Um, uh, material uh, 25, and uh, you say, wait a minute, what the dickens is that? Well, it, it's just a shorthand. I don't know why they felt impelled to make a shorthand, but material 49 is uranium 239, the nine meaning 239, and the four is being Z of 94. Um, material, what they call material or substance uh, 
25 is uranium 235 because it's Z of 92, that's the two, and the five is 235. I, uh, maybe they're trying to save uh, the, the typewriter ribbon on their Corona mechanical typewriter or something. Um, uh, but it's astonishing to me that when you go through and look at the cross sections that they had measured and uh, all the calculations they had done, the thermal cal calculations and so forth, how soon, I mean, these were very smart people. This was the cream of the crop of, you know, the best uh, physicists coming that were sort of, were, that were uh, sort of emigrated from Europe uh, or fled Europe and out of the best graduate schools in the country, many of these people were in fact still graduate students or recent PhDs, how soon after the discovery of fission and, and even really just 10 years after the real uh, advent of nuclear physics and the, the, the first accelerators, the Van de Graaff accelerators and the cyclotrons, they really got it right. Boy, they, they, really, uh, they, they really nailed it in terms of, you know, the, the neutrons per uh, fission, the, what the end gamma cross-section was, the effect of poisons, pre-initiation. They really had figured it all out. I'm, I'm re it's, it's really quite impressive. Um, not everybody, of course, in the class reads this, but I used to hand it out and tell people that they should actually rub their hand on it so you could tell your grandchildren you would rubbed your hand over Cerber's uh, Los Alamos primer. Now you have to rub, rub your hand on the screen, um, but you can also print it out and, uh, and have it as your, uh, keep it on your coffee table. Okay, early on in the document, um, you are going to see that they, they quickly figured out something they figured out that um, the uranium weapon um, uh, that, uh, and as you know from the, the history that Professor Anak talked about, um, we never tested um, the uranium-235 weapon. Um, the uranium, of course, was, we'll talk about this later, uh, you know, obtained by um, both gaseous diffusion up in Hanford, Washington, and electromagnetic uh, separation, what are called the calutrons uh, uh, that at Oak Ridge. I mean, the, in overnight at billions of dollars and thousands and thousands of people, they built up these staggeringly large facilities. Um, you know, there's that anything they wanted, anything money could buy from, you know, from the government to build up these facilities to purify the uranium to, to get weapons grade 235. They figured out they could simply take two cakes. Um, as you'll see later on, they didn't actually take like two cheesecakes of uranium, both subcritical, put them together. They actually had a stack of disks and then a stack of rings that were sliding down uh, a gun barrel uh, like that. But simply putting these things together and at the same time hitting an initiator, um, a plutonium, uh, a polonium beryllium source to make your first neutrons to get the thing going with a suitable tamper around it, uh, tungsten carbide, that that would work. They were so confident of it, they just said, it's obvious it's going to work, we can weaponize it, we don't even need to test it, and they were absolutely right. The plutonium weapon was more complicated, and it was more complicated for the following reason. Um, you needed to start with your mass much closer in, and then crush it quickly spherically. That's more complicated. And there's some interesting physics there that just for cultural things, I'm gonna show you some interesting YouTubes on instabilities, um, which crop up in every field of, almost every field of physics. So why are they different? So here I've taken uh, the NNDC chart and I've zoomed in um, just to figure out, here's uranium-238, here's uranium-235. Um, and um, for the plutonium weapon, what happens uh, is that you can, um, uh, you can basically make, in fact, whether you want to or not, in any reactor, um, given that you're never going to have 100% uranium uh, in there, in fact, most of the time you have um, only low enriched uranium, the bulk of it is uranium, the neutron, uh, 238, the neutrons can capture from 238 to make uranium-239. Um, that has a half-life of 23 minutes. It beta decays to neptunium-239, um, 
has a half-life of 2.4 days, and then beta decays again to plutonium-239. There you are. With plutonium fuel, of course, you then have to take out and reprocess um, chemically. This was the process that was, um, you know, that was um, invented by Seaborg and collaborators at, in September of 42 at the, the Met Lab in Chicago, uh, best chemists in the world at that time. Now, there's a problem. The fly in the ointment for plutonium is the following. The fly in the ointment is that you can also have, once you start building up the plutonium, um, you cook the plutonium. The plutonium then can absorb another neutron. And as you, as you remember, uh, one part in seven of that, you know, was it, what was it, 98 barns compared to 585 barns, will be an N gamma reaction and go, and then you'll end up with um, uh, the plutonium 240. Now, here's the problem. The problem is in these two numbers. First of all, that's a fairly uh, short half-life. Now you might say, oh my God, it's 6,600 years. Well, it turns out that's inconveniently short. Coupled with the fact that the spontaneous fission branching ratio is, uh, you see, is about one part in 10 to the seven. It's 5.7, 10 to the minus 6%. So it's uh, order of magnitude um, uh, when the thing decays, uh, one part in 10 million is spontaneous uh, fission. And of course, when you get fission, you get neutrons. Now, when you calculate um, that, it turns out the um, decay rate, the partial decay rate for uh, spontaneous fission, i.e. creating neutrons is some tiny number of about 10 to the minus 19. And you say, why worry 10 to the minus 19 per second? You know. Well, it turns out um, it doesn't take much plutonium-240 uh, in uh, a 239 uh, weapon, such that in, if you were to use a gun assembly and bring these things together on the order of some milliseconds, um, you would have, both of these things are emitting neutrons uh, into themselves and into one another, um, that uh, these, the neutrons would lead to a pre-initiation. You'd begin to heat the fuel as you, as you started to come together um, and you'd begin to get criticality, heating up the fuel, the fuel would begin to expand and so forth. And you would not get the, the whole thing assembled uh, before the thing fizzled on you. So uh, they realized quickly on that they had the harder job of um, then taking the plutonium in uh, uh, here, this is not exactly how they did it. Here, you know, they, they th showed the thing as kind of like orange pieces coming together. They ended up with sort of a hemisphere, which then they crushed around the initiator. Um, and that that's what they needed to do. If you do this and then you make it happen very spherically, uh, very quickly, um, uh, you, uh, uh, the, the pre-initiation is not an issue. And in fact, they were correct about that. Now, there was yet, Another problem, well, I'll talk about some interesting physics um, a little bit later on. Um, here's a, uh, a government released mock-up of the little boy. This is the uniranium weapon. Uh, it was fused uh, bar bar barometrically and radar-wise to at about 1800 feet, um, 1800 and something feet. And that's exactly what happened when it was actually used in, during the war. Um, as you see, it was barely, um, uh, uh, weaponizable. I mean, the, the B-29s that had to be specially redesigned to carry it. It was, it was uh, uh, not quite five uh, tons, about 4.4 tons, but it's very, and about 10 feet long. Um, this is the, uh, lots of detail here don't pay attention to, but um, here is the, basically what is the gun barrel? I think, in fact, it was a howitzer barrel, uh, 6.5 inches like that. Um, here you see the cordite, three or four bags of cordite. Here you have a basically a pusher, a steel pusher. Here is your tungsten carbide. And then here are the, these little stacked annuli, these little rings of the fuel. Um, here on the other end, you have little disks stacked up um, such that when this thing was driven over it, all of a sudden you'd end up with a cylindrical thing about the size of a, a large Maxwell House coffee can. 
Um, and when this thing came in, it would be completely enclosed in, in uh, several centimeters, very thick uh, uh, of uh, tungsten carbide. You would crush your plut uh, polonium beryllium initiator. Initially, uh, as we calculated that reaction before, you would uh, a very large cross section. You would uh, promptly get out several uh, uh, neutrons uh, from the, you know one per reaction, but and then of course. Um, you're off to the races there, and you'll actually do this calculation. This was the fat man uh, here, uh, uh, a little bit heavier, uh, about the same size, fused to detonate at 500 meters. And um, same thing here, um, uh, the uh, initiator on the inside uh, as well, but a spherical fuel, fuel assembly and then, the, uh, and then your tamper on the outside. Now, interesting piece of history. Um, the British, of course, were participating in the um, project, and um, uh, they had uh, uh, they had assigned people um, to uh, come over and to participate. Uh, one of the people who was um, uh, uh, who was part of the, the the British delegation as part of the Manhattan Project. Uh, was um, Jeffrey Taylor, Jeffrey Ingram Taylor, who was a, uh, lived to the 1970s or so. He was a really a world-class physicist. I mean, just a, uh, he did many, many, many pioneering things uh, in, um, in fluid dynamics, but he was an all around really top-notch physicist. And he gave a seminar, just kind of an open seminar at Los Alamos, um, in the spring of 45 uh, about his work and um, on uh, hydrodynamic instabilities. And uh, it turns out the, the people there, Oppenheimer, were, 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 uh, were, uh, were stunned by this because they realized that what he was telling them is uh, would uh, uh, potentially put the the successful functioning of, of the plutonium device in jeopardy. The idea being, you know, we've always said, you know, you want um, to make things, bring things together in a way that they are uh, uh, sort of compact and uh, if at all possible, symmetric. Um, the, what's now known as the Rayleigh-Taylor instability named after Lord Rayleigh and, and uh, uh, Jeffrey Taylor um, uh, works against that. And, and just as a general comment, no matter almost any field, uh, microscopic field of physics you work in, um, the bane of your existence is, is instabilities. You know, the, the reason why we don't have magnetic fusion yet has to do with a whole host of instabilities with uh, magnetized plasmas. Um, if you go to Livermore with a NIF facility and you try using lasers to compress a pellet, um, the same instabilities that um, show up when you're doing, you know, uh, compression of fuel and nuclear weapons, same thing happens. It's, uh, and you have to work very, very, very hard. Instabilities show up in astrophysics, they show up in um, supernovae explosion, everything. And it's, it's actually very interesting physics. So what I'm going to do, oh, so here's the, the, uh, the Rayleigh-Taylor instability. If I have a dense material sitting on top of a light material, let's just have this thing being sitting there, um, you know, with gravity pointing downwards, okay. Um, the, um, uh, in principle, I can take a heavy fluid and a light fluid uh, separated by a thin sheet of paper or cardboard between two glasses, face to face like this. I can, if I'm very careful, withdraw the paper. And if you don't disrupt the system, there's no perturbations. The heavy will stay on top, the light will stay on the bottom. But of course, that never happens, <laughs> okay? So in fact, the, the tiniest perturbations will begin to grow fingers down, which will evolve initially in a, in a very deterministic, beautiful, uh, predictable mathematical uh, uh, funk way, you get these little mushroom caps, and then they, the, the, the physics of it is such that these things sort of evolve fractally, and you get these very, very beautiful patterns. Now, you could say, what's that got to do with nuclear weapons? 
if I take any light material um, and uh, like high explosives or something like this, and I try to compress a dense material, um, it's like standing in a, um, an elevator when all of a sudden the elevator jerks you up, you artificially get gravity. So in a certain sense, think of this as uh, it's, it's not important that it's gravity, it's important that, it's, that the acceleration vector is working to push the heavy into the light. Whenever one has that situation, not the other situation, but when you have this situation, you get this fingering and instabilities, and then the fuel can get mixed, ejected, whatever, and the thing could die. Let me show at least this one. I think I... That's annoying. So you get the idea there. Um, the um, okay, here I can do the same thing, and of course this is exactly the situation you're going to be forced with if you try to use a series of um, uh, explosive charges uh, as, as symmetrically designed as possible. You can do all kinds of tricks. We won't go into. Um, to compress, spherically compress something, you're going to end up with that. Now, let me show you something. Here is um, site 300 at Livermore. This was a uh, picture uh, taken from 50, 50 years ago. Um, we've been using, this is in Tracy, about mm, 10 miles east of the lab, um, where we uh, test surrogates, um, um, high Z metals, not fissionable. Um, uh, precisely to study uh, hydrodynamic effects. You may have noticed this before when you actually see stop action photographs of explosions, you see these you know, very interesting little jets coming out. And you may say, well, that's kind of interesting. Those are shards of metal, whatever. Indeed, but in fact, that is the, oh, that's the kind of the final state of what happens when you get the interfingering and squirting of your high Z material out. Here's some data from Los Alamos uh, published uh, in um, uh, Philosophical Transactions, British Journal, uh, the Royal Society. Um, this is uh, what are known as shock tube uh, experiments. Uh, it's called a curtain setup. What they do here, it's like the thing I described before. You have, uh, I believe, hydrogen gas on the left of this little um, uh, partition here, and here you have a very heavy gas, uh, sulfur hexafluoride. It's got an atomic weight of 146 uh, or so, very heavy gas. And um, one drives a shock. This is not simply a velocity, but you actually go above Mach 1. And uh, here you get a very accentuated uh, version of that called the Rickmeyer-Meshkoff instability. 
Um, here uh, above is one, Mach 1.2, here's Mach 1.5. And you see these very, very beautiful, very reproducible, even at very late stages. This is almost uh, on top here. This is almost a, um, uh, a millisecond uh, later, 915 microseconds. So it's less than a millisecond later. But you see up until that point, um, you uh, actually see the same uh, period periodically repeated uh, fractal pattern due to this instability. And then here it is um, for um, Mach 1.5 when you actually uh, end up uh, at the final state in the, the frame of the picture here at 415 microseconds. Now, that's what happens when I try to accelerate a heavy fluid into a light fluid. But uh, one thing uh, the astute student will realize is that these things are never one isolated case or another. As soon as I begin to get the fingering, I also now have shear flow between um, heavy uh, uh, high density and low density fluids. And it turns out this is known as the Kelvin Helmholtz instability. Uh, and this you see everywhere. You're probably out hiking uh, and you actually see these kinds of clouds, these cirrus clouds with this repeated pattern. That is in fact um, a, a, an effect of shear among two density uh, layers of, uh, of the atmosphere. Here's a photograph of the surface of Saturn where you get weather just like in many other planets like that. And you actually see the Kelvin Helmholtz instability. Here's thermoclines in the ocean and so forth. So let me, um, play this one here. Ah, this is a computer simulation. Um, in fact, it's done on um, one of the ASCII computers, Department of Energy ASCII computers here. And um, you can see um, as it evolves, you go from first the initial very identical breaking waves into something which becomes more and more uh, turbulent. Uh, like that. We can play it again. Okay, there's your two layers. And you can see there's some noise in the calculation, uh, which gives realism to it, because in fact, they're not all identical. So you actually do get a chaotic behavior. So they are, you don't get absolutely perfectly deterministic behavior. Let's do the next one. Um, I think we got another one here. Oh. This experiment to look at the Kelvin Helmholtz instability of a shear layer between two layers of fluid begins with a clear layer of fresh water on top of a denser red dyed layer of salty water in a long horizontal tank. To set up this experiment, the empty tank is tilted and then half filled with fresh water. Very slowly, so as not to mix the fluids, dyed salty water is introduced from the bottom corner of the tilted tank. This has been speeded up in the movie. Still working very slowly, the tank is tilted back towards the horizontal and frequent checks are made that the fluids are not sloshing around. When all is ready, the tank is tilted quickly to an angle of about eight degrees. The dense, salty water flows downhill, while the lighter, fresh water flows uphill, and thus shear is generated between the two layers. Suddenly, the interface between them becomes unstable. Let's watch that again closer up. Remember, the lower dyed layer is flowing to the left, while the clear layer flows to the right. The instability initially forms a distinctive pattern, but quickly generates turbulence and mixing of the fluids. Keep your eyes open and you'll see interesting flows like this all around you. Okay. 
Good. All right. I think we're doing good on time here. Um, this is um, the, um, the, the very reaction uh, that was, um, I forget, it might have been americium rather than polonium, but Ch Chadwick in 1932 discovered the neutron. That remember, we, we did your first calculation of a Q value for a reaction <laughs> based on uh, helium-4 and beryllium-9 giving rise to a neutron in carbon-12 with a very large uh, Q value here, half a bar in cross-section. And, and so the idea is if you take a separated assembly, like a beryllium ball and shell, and crush the thing, it mixes up, and the very first time you get a, a, a helium-4 interacting with beryllium-9 in a neutron, um, uh, off you go. You've got your neutron that begins the chain reaction. Okay, um, before we, uh, th that was um, uh, uh, at some next lecture, I'm gonna describe a little bit um, with Jake's indulgence, a problem that you're going to do. We, we assigned it last year and I think everyone did very well where you actually work through Cerber for a very simplified weapon um, and, uh, you know, uh, it, it is quite astonishing uh, that how quickly it goes. In fact, I think many of you know that the, um, uh, the, the early weapon ears, I think it was in, uh, invented by uh, Edward Teller, the, uh, uh, the definition of a shake uh, being uh, 10 nanoseconds, um, and the idea being that it, the, uh, once you, the uh, supercritical reaction goes, it's all over in what he called two shakes of a lamb's tail, using an old expression. Um, uh, to tell you the answer you're going to find if you take a, um, a little boy type fuel assembly and you actually do the numbers and you'll actually in this problem work through all the numbers uh, a la Cerber, um, you actually find that the whole thing goes, you know, the, you, you go from uh, basically cold fuel at essentially normal density um, to uh, 14 kilotons in 100 nanoseconds. I mean, it's astonishingly fast. It's unbelievably fast um, how you all of a sudden get multiplication out to 60 or 80 generations. Um, uh, just a few things here and then we'll stop and then we will get on to uh, next time we will talk a little bit about thermonuclear weapons, two-stage weapons. There I'm going to dance very gingerly. <laughs> We're not going to talk in a lot of detail there uh, uh, on that topic, uh, but I'll give you the rudiments of it and show you an interesting, um, some interesting footage, uh, short YouTube there that has some uh, uh, quite interesting local, i.e. Berkeley campus, uh, 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 interest uh, to it. Um, once we were full at it with the Soviets, so the Soviet threat, um, the, um, you know, the, the, the uh, weapons, as many people have described, uh, are incredibly seductive. I mean, the, when you think of, I mean, you know, the best physicists in the middle of the 20th century spent, you know, many of them spent much of their, or a good part of their career uh, working for a while at the labs, uh, designing weapons, and, and, and the, what you can do with them is limited only by the imagination. The little gun type uh, weapons, uh, the Iranian weapons um, actually uh, got, you know, turned into artillery shells um, that would have been played a major role in, in uh, repulsing a Soviet uh, advance through where it was expected in Germany. Uh, this, you know, this war game was played thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of times, you know, to, to see if we, in fact, we could uh, repulse the uh, Soviet invasion into the through the NATO forces. Uh, there's a little um, uh, thing there, a little uh, uh, sort of mobile or portable rocket called the Davy Crockett. After a while, I think it was realized that these things were were <laughs> not a good idea, uh, <laughs> and were all taken uh, out of uh, commission by uh, 1970. Um, this is interesting. Um, before 1962, uh, when we had uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the limited test ban treaty, we went underground. Um, when you went, uh, you, you know, when you scheduled a uh, vacation in um, Las Vegas, you could, you know, play the slot machines, you could listen to Frank Sinatra, you could 
you know, lounge around the, uh, the swimming pool, but they published in the newspaper, uh, they told you when the next um, uh, above ground nuclear test was going to be, and that was only about 60 miles away. So you could take in a show when you're at Las Vegas as well. Here's a picture <laughs> uh, taken uh, from 1957 here. And um, this is uh, from the uh, picture from, uh, I guess, from the newsroom. And there is the plume from a, a weapon that was larger, uh, larger yield than Hiroshima that was actually, uh, uh, it was a airburst at 700 feet. Um, and uh, back then, I think uh, we were sort of a fairly patriotic people. People would go out there and say, yeah, man, give it to them, you know? So I think nowadays we think this is a bad idea uh, to pop these things off above ground. And as I mentioned, I think I'm going to stop about right now. So let me tell you about two things uh, that we will just kind of gingerly uh, uh, dance around uh, uh, here is that uh, one is the notion of, um, uh, of boosting which is the use of um, a limited amount of fusion reaction in the primary to give you fast neutrons to cut down the, the mass that you need to, uh, for a weapon to go off. And then two-stage weapons um, where uh, you are able to uh, have a primary and secondary where you can enormously boost the energy of a, uh, a weapon. Um, the uh, two from um, Hiroshima style, you know, uh, 10, uh, order of magnitude 10 kilotons to megatons and 10 megatons and, and uh, the Soviets uh, in uh, the Tsar Bomba atmospheric test in 1957, 59, something like that was uh, uh, set off when it was 54, 57 megatons in the atmosphere and it scared the dickens out of the Soviet generals themselves when they realized what they had created. Uh, there is one unclassified report. I'll, I'll also put that up on the web. Um, it was the uh, it was an unclassified uh, version of Teller and Ulam. Stanislaus Ulam was a Polish mathematician. And uh, there was some jostling about uh, historical uh, uh, contention about whose idea was, you know, came from. In fact, I think both um, for the idea of the, uh, of this weapon. Now, I put this up as a bit of a joke because it's a 20 page document. And um, when everything else has been blanked out, there's only about two pages left. And after reading it, um, you certainly will not be able to reconstruct a thermonuclear weapon. You might be able to create a washing machine or a, a power lawnmower, but you, it, it is so, <laughs> it is, it, it is uh, so, uh, uh, it, it is, uh, it's so devoid of any uh, useful uh, technical uh, information, quantifiable information that, uh, uh, but anyway, it's been declassified. Um, okay, we're about where we should be. So let me stop now. Um, and I'm gonna make a couple of comments here and then I'm gonna pass the ball to Mansuk, Aaron and Jake. So we're now, um, uh, uh, we're now four weeks into the class. Um, so you've got about 10 weeks left. Um, let me stop sharing. I beat it, sir. Okay. Uh, good. Yeah. Thank you. I stopped sharing. Um, okay. So um, it's uh, time to get going with the capstone project. And um, the one thing I wanted to uh, uh, say is just give a little introduction to what will happen Monday, and then I'm going to let Mansuk, uh, uh, Aaron, and Jake uh, take over from there. Uh, we discussed among ourselves with Professor Nacht um, what would be a excellent background information to give focus to this, because the whole discussion of um, NPRs and um, you know low yield nukes and so forth could be completely theoretical, particularly for uh, students who may be new to the business without kind of focusing the mind. And um, so Brad Roberts, who wrote one of the books that you read uh, in this course, um, 
uh, head of um, the Center for um, Global Security Research at Livermore National Lab, um, and who's dealt with the Russians and the Chinese and everybody else in the business, um, is one of the premier authorities on, on sort of nuclear weapons and arms control. Um, uh, organized about three or four years ago, a two-day uh, tabletop exercise, a two-step exercise, AKA war game. The first day or day and a half of which was unclassified. Uh, the last part, which um, we retreated into the skiff uh, for the uh, sort of a classified version of the, the end of it, where he brought together about 150 people, many senior military leaders from the Pentagon and from the uh, uh, you know, the combatant commands, um, experts, you know, the intelligence experts from Los Alamos and Livermore. Um, there were, um, uh, you know, obviously uh, design people and other tacticians, policy people and so forth, people like Professor Knock and so forth. And it was a scenario about the Baltic states. Um, and as Jake, I hope gives you a, some explanation in one of the breakout um, uh, sessions, um, the Soviets have been fast at work developing about 20 and, um, you know, um, sort of uh, ground to air, uh, ground to ground, every, uh, a whole suite of very specifically tailored small nuclear weapons for tactical usage, which is rather frightening. You say, well, you know, this is a country that's not necessarily very rich. Why on earth are they investing in this? And so the war game um, had to do with the Baltic uh, state, a Baltic state scenario. Uh, and it begins with something which is in fact, I think a, a fact and not a, a, a hypothesis of the war game. And that is thank the Russian Duma in uh, the parliament in 19, 2013 or so, right, basically declared that the Baltic states were actually sovereign Russian territory. Frightening thought. Uh, one can see where this is heading. Um, and um, early on in this war game, in fact, um, out came the Russian Federation nukes actually, uh, actually used. And, and then what the NATO and US actually kind of found themselves a little bit, you know, um, sort, of, sort, of, um, sort of behind events. And at the end of two days, we discovered we did not have a lot of very good conclusions or very good options to blunt what was this uh, thing of the escalate to the escalate. Um, so uh, to put a sharp point on this and to focus the mind on why these small nukes are important, what are their implications in an adversary's hands and what might be the application? Uh, uh, we're going to actually have him give a, uh, a summary of what happened four years ago. Then to take it away. So at this point, let me pass it on to whoever's going to talk, Mansouk or Aaron or. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry, Jake was just responding to a very long question. Uh, um, Michael, we'll, 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 we'll finish getting to this in a second. Jake doesn't like my keyboard. So, you know, he's been puffing and puffing about the whole thing. So uh, for all the lab members who, um, you know, are, are exempt from having to do group, uh, you know, uh, sort of participate in this in this uh, student project. We won't we won't bore you with the with the with the details. So you're you're welcome to jump ship whenever you'd like. Um, but uh, in the meantime, we'd like to get you started on this project. Like Carl said, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do some of the talking. Jake's gonna uh, jump in and probably Mansook too when I when I butcher some of it. But uh, you know, until then, let's let's get started. So um, first of all, no one have a no one have a panic attack. Uh, I've gotten several uh, you know a very um, eager questions, panicked questions about, about this uh, project. So I just want to, uh, you know, massage everyone's fears here that this is going to be fun. It's going to be fine. You'll produce something beautiful. Maybe it'll get submitted for publication. Everyone will be happy, probably. All right. So um, the U.S. military and intelligence community sources believe that Russia employs a so-called escalate to de-escalate strategy in their deployment of sub-strategic nuclear weapons. Uh, these are some really important terms. We'll go over them in discussion. But uh, this strategy asserts that nuclear weapons could be used early in a conflict to deter conventional retaliation in an initial conventional attack. This would allow Russian forces to take an area and prevent the expulsion of their forces through the use of a low yield nuclear weapon. The lack of NATO nuclear options at a similar level of escalation could then deter further action. So um, 
This is just a little bit of background to, to get us into this. Uh, moreover, in, in East Asia, China has adopted what Washington terms as uh, A2AD or anti-access aerial denial to thwart US intervention in the, sen in the event of ch uh, Chinese aggression in the South or East China Sea. This consists of preventing carrier groups from coming close enough to mainland China to participate in a conflict, as well as preventing aircraft from uh, entering Chinese airspace. Basically, it's keep away with their area. You know, don't come, don't come near me. That's 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 sort of what the name name of the game is. The, uh, the Biden administration will need to review these topics, um, sort of following the Trump policies, to determine their suitability for a national security policy. Effectively, things have changed uh, uh, in the game. Every couple of years, the, the, the president uh, puts out what's called a nuclear posture review. And this is sort of the acting US strategy. Uh, this is supposed to sort of confront a series of new technological, political, sociological issues in the nuclear community uh, and in the national defense community. And uh, now that we have a new president, uh, we can we can begin to to sort of explore whether uh, whether sort of what Biden will do. So the topic for our for our, our class project this year is uh, the review of U.S. nuclear weapons policy. It's a little bit more specific than the than the last couple of years. So I'm just going to read this so that everyone follows. This has been posted in B courses. Um, there's a little bit more in this uh, slideshow, and we'll post the newest version uh, shortly. And then we'll prepare, we'll sort of walk you through how we're all gonna do this as one big happy group. Uh, it has been determined by some defense anal uh, analysts uh, and the Trump administration that the US needs low yield nuclear weapons to prevail in such conflicts or to deter Russian or Chinese aggression. In response to these challenges, the Trump administra uh, administration called for the development of new low yield submarine launched ballistic missiles, SLBMs, uh, and uh, more specifically the W-76-2, which Jake will go into a very uh, riveting technical explanation, and a new low yield submarine launched cruise missile, the SLCM, in the 2018 nuclear posture review. Uh, the, the, both, both this and the Biden New, uh, NPRs have been have been, or sorry, the the Obama, the 2010 Obama NPR have been posted into the B courses for everyone to review. The assignment is uh, using the time remaining in the semester. The class will produce a single report. We want something that we all work together on. Uh, uh, the class will will be divided. In, this sort of uh, uh, report will be divided into two parts. Um, the, uh, the basis of which is the decision on the continuation of both low yield SLBM and SLCM system uh, requires an examination of technical intelligence, deterrence, arms control, alliance, and budgetary considerations. All of these things are fair game for you to consider as you construct this initial report. Now in part one, the class will work together to address these issues by drafting the report introduction on the NPR, historical background, and a summary of the strategic goals and technical information that will be used sort of as criteria in part two. Basically, you establish a sort of standard basis point by which all of the uh, subgroups can therefore build on. In part two, the class will be divided into three groups to, to examine different solutions to this problem. Now, again, the problem here is we are now in the, in the Biden administration. We have two previous administrations. Uh, the world is a different place. What should we or what should the Biden administration do with our uh, assumed uh, suggestions? And that is the project. Jake, is that? Sure, that sums it up fairly well. All right, great. So group one will support the Trump era 2018 NPR. Uh, and this will be the continuation or even the expansion of these low yield programs. Group two will, will support the reduction of these programs uh, sort of in, in line with the Obama uh, administration report. And group three will argue for a middle ground. Uh, this, this is sort of uh, up, up to you guys. We, we want creative solutions. This could be, you know, something about, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, go into, we'll go into more examples later. Um, each group needs to provide sufficient evidence and analyses to sort of support their claims. So um, 
Each group will provide an in-class uh, in class presentations of their work. Um, uh, sorry, the, the beginning line is incorrect. Uh, and then you will submit a final report. Part one of this, sort of all the introduction and background information will be due Friday, March 26th. And part two will be due Friday, May 10th, which is right, I think, around the time of the final presentations for this class. So uh, this is a very uh, crudely made slide, but I randomized some groups. I will assign these later. Now, before everyone like, you know, scatters and decides they hate their group members, uh, um, the, these, are, these are the groups. If possible, you should stay in your group. If you have a moral or appellant dislike of a specific point uh, that you would need to argue, please see uh, me and Jake or, or Mansook or, or the teaching team in general, send a message to all of us and um, you know, explain, explain your reasoning and we can try and have you switched. Uh, wanting to work with your friends is not a sufficient reason, although I understand that it is fun to work with your friends. I'd also like to add in that we want to make sure that the few policy people that we have are reasonably well distributed within the groups. Um, so we still need to audit this with respect to distribution of, of you know, highly policy literate people. Um, I did an initial look, but I could have screwed that up. All right. Everyone feeling good so far? Everyone, everyone ready, excited, willing? Yeah. Feeling Questions. great. All right, the excitement is almost too much to bear. So as, 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 as uh, Professor, uh, Professor Van Bibber mentioned, on Monday we'll have this special table, tabletop exercise by Brad Roberts we, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Baltic states. This will sort of give you a, 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 a more integrative, uh, immersive feel for A2AD. And then on March 3rd, which is next Wednesday, uh, uh, Jake uh, Mansook and I will go into a larger presentation of the class and we can sort of be here to answer your questions. So I, um, I, I, I just offer a couple initial notes in this. Uh, initial li literature has been posted in B courses, not just the NPRs, but some of the technical information that might be of interest. We will continue to add that and send announcements as we do it. And the GSIs will be available at office hours and the dis and discussion section for questions. Uh, in addition to this, we will be setting up a series of things that we'd like you to read in advance of the tabletop exercise. And uh, we are very excited for you to, to do all of this. We've also posted previous year's uh, final products to give you a, a sense of, of what, you're, what you're competing against. Uh, our, 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 and our, uh, our final project has actually just been accepted for publication by, by Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. So anyone who, who, who wants to step up and lead this and you know, uh, get, it, get, it, get their version into a better, better journal, we, we, we eagerly, we eagerly uh, await that kind of challenge. Anyway, so uh, with that, I think we have, let's see how much longer we have. We have two whole minutes for questions. Let me just comment that, I, and we do appreciate, uh, this is a high level graduate class and there's a lot of reading assigned, um, but Brad Roberts' book is an, a really excellent background to grappling with this particular thing. I think, you know, it, Hearing a particular scenario like you'll hear on Monday, but also really reading the the book and you know the different countries' kind of uh, uh, postures and philosophies with respect to nuclear weapons um, and their histories and their uh, contexts is, I think, really, really, really important to do this well. Agreed. If any of the lab members are, 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 are still here and want to contribute to, to, to helping out uh, the, the student groups on this project, please um, send, send out a, a message. That would be effectively lovely. We obviously cannot compel you to, to do any of that. I can't certainly, but, uh, but um, perhaps if you, are, if you are so interested, please make yourself available. Everyone, everyone excited, everyone happy? I have a question if you got a second. Yes, great. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> you, I saw you talked about, you know, parts one and two and then the different kind of focus of each group. Um, is your presentation on the third going to talk about more like breakdown of what work you're looking for in formats and stuff? Yes, I, I'm happy to provide the template that we used last uh, or two years ago, which I, I see was stolen by last year's group. Uh, I, I guess that group didn't think I'd recognize my own latex. Um, uh, 
I think that when we did this, we, I think we had a couple of very uh, eager beaver students who just sort of came in and initially like created a, a Slack group, uh, drew up straws, and then posted uh, sort of groups and, and divided the work fairly evenly. If you guys are, 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 are less interested in that, we, can, we will certainly be going through what we think should be in each section, at least for part one. The whole point of part one is twofold. One, uh, one, of, one of these goals is to establish everything uh, that needs to be sort of laid out for a background and laying out all of the initial technical aspects that need to be examined by each of the three subgroups in part two. We, are, we, will, we will do that and, and, and construct a rubric if, if that is of interest to the class. Um, but then you have to stick with the rubric and you can't just you know, go off into your own, into your own uh, imagination and come up with something brilliant. It's up to you though. We're not here to muddle anyone's destiny. Does that answer your question sufficiently? Um, partly, I guess, I guess I was really kind of asking like, what, how is this being, um, how is the group, like each individual group organizing their data and stuff? So I, I personally, and, and I, might, I might be alone in this, when, I know that when we did it, uh, groups were self-organized. Uh, I don't, I don't, we're, most of us are graduate students here, uh, and I personally do not like being policed. Uh, I, I think many of us share that. If, if you need help organizing, you can reach out to the teaching team and, and we'd be happy to help. But self-organization, I think, is, is the name of the game. I think that's what, what, what you get paid the big bucks for when you're in industry or, or have a job outside of, of academia, in my opinion. Oh, okay, thanks. Are you volunteering, Greg? Uh, nope, not yet. <laughs> So you've already made these groups, but you talked about making a Slack as well for this, right? Would you right. be making this or would we be making it ourselves? So I think we, we answered something like this in, in discussion and we, we'd be happy to answer this again. Uh, Jake and I do not want to be in charge of the Slack that this class uses. Um, we want uh, my, my suggestion to someone in the nuclear engineering group is the largest subset of this class is going to be in nuclear engineering. And so I would suggest that someone in nuclear engineering invites all non-nuclear engineering students to the nuclear engineering Slack group and then constructs a, a series of subgroups from there. That would be the simplest operational method for getting everyone in one Slack group, short of creating one, uh, you know, all, all, for, for this. I know that when we did it, we had an undergraduate student who very quickly captured everyone's emails and produced their own independent Slack group. This is of course up to you. Uh, I think. All right, looks like people are already okay. knowing about oh. that in the chat. So that's fantastic. Yeah. All right, cool, cool, cool. Any, um, other, any other questions? I know we're three minutes over, um, so. Uh, Can I yeah. see the group names again? Oh my goodness. Go back to the group names. Re sorry, one more time? Can we just go back to see the who's in what group again? <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm going to post this directly after the, after the, uh, after the, the, the class is over. Does anyone want to, uh, and, and, and I, 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 would, I would love this, is, does anyone have, you know, really want to levy a major complaint? Preston, you, you seem like a complainer. Oh, um, do I have any complaints? Um, I mean, it seems pretty self-explanatory, like what needs to be done and the steps moving forward. Right. Um, I'll take it. Actually, I don't this time. All right. Our right. time. All right. That, hooray, everyone. All right. And, and we will discuss this more along with the midterm. Uh, again, no one panic, which is which will be coming up in a couple of weeks uh, in discussion this this Friday. We'll record discussion if you can't be there. Thank you, everyone, for for your patience while we while we roll this out. I think this is going to be a wonderful, wonderful final project. Um, Thank you, Mansuk, for, for helping develop so much of this. 
quick Thank comment. Thank you. All right. Have a great one, everyone. Um, we already have a 285 general Slack channel that I can go ahead and add everyone to, but for the individual group channels, we can kind of manage that within group, I guess. So um, sound. I just made, Sounds like we have a spy in our midst. I just made those groups right now. Look at you guys already on top of it. I'm going to go now. Have a great one. Anna? Thank you. Thanks, buddy.